Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, edition of Verifiability Talks. It's my honor to introduce uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Effie Law. Uh, she is a professor of human computer interaction. She has a background in psychology and has been doing human computer interaction for, for a very long time. She has been doing uh, lots of interesting topics about chatbots, about um, uh, remote education, and in particular, this topic has become very, very prominent in the COVID time and, and the effectiveness of remote education. And in the context of verifiability nodes, we are very much looking forward to collaborating with FE on, uh, on bringing human in the loop. And this is exactly the topic that FE will be talking about. And, and uh, she will be talking about the effect of human in the loop in trust and, and uh, probably other stuff that I don't know about. So I'm very <laughs> much looking forward to your talk, Effie. The floor is yours. And thank you very much for having accepted to give this talk. Thank you. So thank you for the introductions and thank you for them for inviting me. So now I stopped the video. So just in case the bandwidth issue. OK, then I can now go to the full screen now. OK, so I hope all of you can see my slide. Yes, okay. it's very clear. Thank you. OK, great. So um, the, the title of my talk is a little bit uh, playful. So because it is um, extracted from a fictional dialogue between a human user and a chatbot. So, but I'm curious whether you will trust this chatbot anyway. So, and this is a, just um, set a, a stage. So I'll talk more about chatbot later. So, and this is the overview of my talk. So I'm not sure that I will have time to cover all these points, but there are three major parts that I would like to cover. So, and first of all, I always tend to start my work with a working definition. So, and I found this one from a publication of our colleague in, our, in the note is from Michael Fisher. It's in uh, uh, Communication ECM in 2013. So the autonomous systems are system designed for themselves what to do and when to do it. So and varying in the degree of autonomy used from the pure human control to minimal human interactions. So then this is confirms that so humans is play a very important role in autonomous system. So it's a selective inclusion of human involvement in a task. So in this diagram, so illustrate a feedback loop between a robot and a human user. So the robot wants to know if the user is satisfied with his performance. And the user, based on her interaction experience with the robot, will curate a response. In this uh, apologies, on, Effie, yeah. I, I forgot to say that at the beginning. I'm really sorry. This meeting is being recorded and will be put on YouTube. So uh, your initials, uh, or if you have an icon, that might appear in the YouTube team. I just want, had to make this disclaimer, which I forgot. I'm sorry about that. No problem. And this ongoing process can validate and update user model and mental model. So at the end, we will improve the trustworthiness of the robot and the user trust in it. So this is this uh, cycle I want to illustrate. So the two terms actually, the user model and mental models can be confusing. So user model may consist of formalism, so such as production rules and semantic network. So which may represent a person preference and emulate some aspect of her knowledge and her reasoning about some situation. Mental models, including a person's belief in conceptual process, maybe represent the same formalism, so, and they also it's also represent computational cognitive models. So in this example, so the user believes that the chatbot has a playful character, but the chatbot represent the user as a task oriented user. So it may be the other way around. So so can be a functional expectation and it was a fun a fun seeking user. This can be a different and um, this mismatch representation will lead to some odd dialogue. So and then user experience become bad. So this is also one of the uh, main reasons why we need human in the loop is to ensure the high usability and positive use experience of autonomous systems. So other reasons, including so handle complex tasks in unstructured and uncertain environment, and also maximize 
accuracy of, of the of the task and also elicit some value added content and features and also have to meet some regulations, safety, legal and financials. But at the end of the day, it's what we want to is to enhancing the trustworthiness, adding the T to the AS. Yes. So and human interact actually with the autonomous systems on a daily basis and also it's important to understand the, the mechanism of these interactions and to design the algorithms to con for the control sharing between humans and the system so the human role can be participatory so when interacting with the autonomous systems for example so um in a synchronous mode like collaborative assembly the social robots it can also be participatory, but uh, asynchronous, like in machine learning, doing the data annotation. Or human play a supervisory role in the real-time interaction with autonomous systems, like in autonomous driving or autonomous car. So I will uh, talk each of them uh, the example for each case. So first look at this participatory and synchronous interactions. So this is um, the work in by the researcher in UC Berkeley. So you can see here the human movement are modeled by sensor-based tracking data. So, but there are many variables, many degree of freedom and individual difference. So the challenge is really to select the right set for a particular scenario. So, and this is the human robot collaborative manipulations. So this illustrates, so a robot and a human they try together to fit the lift and move an object together. So the challenge really have to unify the formal language. So, and as I mentioned about um, the user model and the mental model. So, and and to predict the intent. So what the, what the human operator really want to do. So, and actually in daily life, human and human interactions already quite difficult. We always have the wrong prediction or, or about the intent of the uh, of the uh, a collaborator. So, but human machine may make it even more challenging. So, and look at the, the case about participatory and asynchronous interactions. So, and this is uh, when the AI classifier so is confident about certain prediction they will send to the output. So if the prediction are uncertain, it will go sent back to the human annotators to correct or up update annotations. So this is result in kind of active learning. So maybe I simplify the process, but you can see that the human also play a very important role in this case. So initially they annotate a set of subset and through this process they have to improve and make the classifier work back, uh, better. So um, the annotation challenge actually is very particular uh, salient in the automatic emotion recognitions. So the image in the middle actually is um, a prototype. So when the user speak to the phone, so the red dot will move around. So to show one of the four smileys, so where you're close to, are you happy or are you sad or you're angry? So later these companies are their own. So uh, they produce uh, apps. So the mobile apps, when you talk to the app, they can show you your emotional state. Actually, this annotation challenge about the, the emotion state is uh, it publishes one of um, our paper last year. So then I now talk about a case about uh, autonomous driving. So it's the supervisory role in the synchronous real time mode. So um, okay. So in the human in the loop in the cyber uh, uh, physical systems, so it involves interaction design and control sharing strategies. So for the interaction design, we talk about usability, UX, user experience, and user-centered design, UCD. So their relations can be depicted with this diagram, but uh, not all HCI people will agree with what I, what I represent here, but this is my, my, my interpretations. So but anyway, no time to go into detail about this. So in the context of synchronous human robot control sharing. So the three human factors are, are very relevant, attention, fatigue, and stress. So I, I remember two weeks ago, Anna also mentioned in her talk about stress and uh, fatigue. So, and this is critical, it's important to improve trust by design. So 
presenting the process and output in an interpretable, interpretable way, so and provide satisfying explanations. I will talk more about explanations later. So anyway, the big challenge is really the human computer integration. Now we not only talk about interaction, you talk about integrations. So using multi-sensory signals, audio, visual, text, whatever, or, or skin conductance, all this signal to infer a user mental state. At the end, we want to understand the intent of the human user and try to adapt the, the, the interaction mechanism and the user interface accordingly. So this is um, human the loop. Actually, um, in HCI, so we have a developed uh, different tools to model humans' cognitive structure and the task analysis. So, and like GOMS and HTA and Concur trees. So there are many variations of this model anyway. So and, and more recently, we have the function to the task design process model. So we will make use of this model in, in, uh, in our node later. And this diagram illustrates a high level human in the loop framework. So first, a domain expert and a interaction designer. So together, they define the human in the loop requirement, task and action. So then the interaction designer will the, the map this action into interaction mechanism. So and then the input will, will all this input will be fed to the uh, developer. So then you, he will or they will implement the prototypes. So and this will be test with user. So with the validation user based test. So the output all this result will then loop back to the uh, to redefine the task and action and also redefine the interaction mechanism. So this ongoing process will happen throughout the development uh, life cycle. So now look at the, the autonomous driving example. So in this uh, autonomous uh, vehicle example, so we always talk about passing control from human to car or the other way around. And there are also different different types of takeover and, and handover. So like, uh, of course, the emergency cases are more difficult challenge to deal with. And this is a kind of um, a, a, a plan or model to illustrate. So how human in the loop task can be uh, realized. So bear in mind that this human in the loop task always have a four back plan. So in case, for example, the human cannot take over the driving task. So the car should stop. And this is the full uh, back plan. So and the human in the in the loop task uh, is preceded by several actions. So the preparatory actions, feedback actions and core actions, I will describe more later. So and the actions is actually is the trigger either by the car or by human at a certain attention level. And so note that the, the human in the loop task take place also under certain conditions, the system condition and the human conditions. On the human side, we talk about the opportunity, willingness and capacity. Again, I'll explain more about later. So, and this is the takeover task. Um, the, the, so this is the, the core action. You have core actions, three core actions and one feedback actions. So the feedback actions where the car inform the human about the driving mode when it over uh, occurs. So on the vertical axis, you can see the different attention level. And this one, we talk about the preparatory actions. So uh, as I mentioned about the O, W and C. So the opportunity is the prerequisite. So the human, of course, uh, if they take over the task or handover, it should be the, in the driver's seat. The human hands will be on the wheel, the radio volume is no otherwise would be very distracting. So, and then the willingness is the predisposition. So rather the human attention is high enough or the human stress level is low to um, uh, accommodate the, the over task. And the capacity is about the skill, ability and the state. So the human emotion should be positive and then the training should be ready to drive the car. So these are all the conditions should be met before the takeover can take place. So and this um, uh, illustrates so how the human and the car can be alert through different interaction modalities. So uh, also, also a different level of so-called obtrusiveness. So different level of obtrusiveness is to attract att uh, attract the attention. So so when I speak loudly, so I can catch the attention of the driver better. So 
So there are all, all different uh, uh, ways to alert each other. So, um, of course, uh, somehow we have to go to the state to evaluate rather, rather this design is, is, is good or, or bad or need to be improved. So in the HIL and HCI, we have a lot of so-called uh, development tools and development evaluation kits to evaluate the, the prototypes. So and so in this diagram, you can see it's a simulation uh, 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 setting. So uh, this lady, so he sure so she is uh, asked to um uh, look at her mobile phone at the same time she also should, should be ready to take over the driving at a certain time but she, uh, because if she look at her her mobile phone she's distracted so even the the, um, the car signal that please take the wheel but he she didn't get the, um, the signal so this will turn into a disaster so if in real life situations so and uh, and anyways, in this condition, we also measure different dimensions, the usability, the user experience, rather the driver feel very stressful or feel very frustrated or enjoy the experience. So we need that we have different technique to measure the quantitative and also qualitative technique like the interview and also measure different psychophysiological data. So this is the, the evaluation we can do in the uh, human in the loop um, and uh, um, autonomous system interactions. So all, all about this, uh, you remember that the title of my talk is the implications. So all this is about the trust. So how we about this human the loop lead to uh, the the, uh, the trust level? How to calibrate it? How to improve it? So as I mentioned, there are always start something with the definitions. Here's another definition of trust and trustworthiness. So but I'm not reading it uh, out loud. So but this is from the and. Um, um, the management review. So basically, so all our understanding about trust, we borrow quite a lot from human and human uh, relations literature. So, but then we can look in other trust definitions. This is from the human factors. So the attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual goals in a situation characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. So, and then bear in mind that trust is not static and trust is dynamic and also it's a kind of attitude. So make it quite challenging to, to measure. So, and I propose that, so basically there are three major types of quality. So, and contribute to the trust in autonomous system is the pragmatic related to usability, affective, the emotional, the use experience, and also about the epistemic. So about the reasoning, about the knowledge, it's the human AI interactions. So again, this work will elaborate um, in the course of this note. So, and more recent in, in the studies in social robotics. So this is the, um, uh, the, the work they have um, uh, achieved. So it illustrates the concept about the, the under trust and over trust. So you can see there are different consequences. So of the under trust and the over trust. So and at the end, we try to really optimize uh, the, the right level. So to avoid undesir undesirable situations or, or consequence. So the challenge at the end of the day is really how to formalize and operationalize. So this construct. So and, and trust, there are many different ways to measure it. Self-reported, so we use quite a lot of questionnaire. So and this is one by Hoffman's. Uh, I think the literature is used quite quite a lot in XAI, and also the sensor base. So psycho psychophysiological data we can measure the the skin conductance and the EEGs. So, but of course this is very challenging to calibrate what what the EEG. So how the pattern map to the tr high level or low level trust, and also when to measure trust. Is it during the process? or at the end of interacting with a system. So actually, this is the same argument we have uh, uh, work on in the user experience. Also, when is the right moment to measure user experience? So now come to this measuring trust, we have the same challenge. So, um, so look at this overall, the challenge and the task for human uh, trust in autonomous system. So it's the building the vocabulary and the semantics for the multi models. So the human robot uh, communications. So I believe this is um, the work that Anna and her teams are working on to build uh, the common vocabulary to to work together with the human and robot. So and it's also very challenging to build a computational model, uh, how trust evolves over time. So if the trust violates, how can we repair it? So this is all this 
and we have to uh, formalize it and, and to, to validate. So, and also the sense of fusion. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, there's so many different sources of data. Would these all data converge to say the same thing or they, they really diverge, they infer different results? This is also the challenging, uh, it's a very challenging task to face in the future. So, and also have to design the empirical, st the empirical study to enable enable us to draw our uh, ready conclusions. So talking about trust and say transparency is, is really going hand in hand. So uh, again, I, I really like to show definitions to, to build the ground of the work. So here is the definition of a transparency. So I want to highlight is the, the, the notion of intent. So we always talk about intent, the agent intent, how can you derive it? So this is um, uh, really a key key challenge to deal with. So, and there's also a list of heuristics, so to say, to enhance transparency. I will not go through in detail, but one I want to point out is about uncertainty. The convey uncertainty directly will it really increase trust or really eventually decrease trust. So actually, there are really contradicting results out there. So one study, so say that if you convey uncertainty, so let, let the robot tell the human user, so uh, they, they don't know about certain thing, it may increase trust, but the other studies show that it will decrease trust. So obviously, so we need more uh, research in this uh, topic, in this area. So basically, so we can uh, see that um, there are some, we can derive some basic principle for human in the loop de design. So, but one may be, <clears throat> so there, but the, these are very pretty high level, you can see that. So the first principle, for example, value human values. So, but then this can be controversial it's because uh, not all human values are good, but then uh, who can judge them? So this is uh, uh, quite uh, um, a challenge, uh, controversial issues. So, and the second bullet point is related to the task analysis. So already mentioned that uh, we will do use some uh, task modeling to um, uh, simulate the, the, the work and also the cognitive processing. And also the third bullet point is to mention about en enabling human to understand what is going on, can help them not to over rely on the system so they, they can they understand what's going on they can uh, interfere or jump in uh, when necessary so and at the end is how the system make it interpretable so then the, the human can understand what's going on so and then the the, so the interaction will be uh, better so talk about the <clears throat> The in, but interpretivity is related to the exp explainability, so what I'll turn to next. So we can see here, so the road of the UX specialist, so it's, it's really like a bridge surfing the both side, bringing the user requirement and, and, <clears throat> and design of XAI to closer to the uh, and communicate with the developers at the end, so that the whole team work together. So, and the type of the explanation method depend really on the on the uh, algorithmic models. So, how complex the model is. So, this addresses specific applications, or this is and uh, which stage of development. So, this is related to the uh, the how to um, decide the explanations methods. And also about um, uh, the content of the explanation. So, user center uh, XAIs we have to present something that's understandable to the user. So then the content will, de will describe about, for example, the relatively weight of different features and which part of the decision tree and which rules are used to come up to a decision, uh, to a recommendation or to come up to a certain actions. So, but then it depends rather we explain the whole model and or we ex explain only uh, particular predictions. So or we give some so-called uh, counterfactuals, what if. So, or give some example to, to um, uh, make the user, enable the user to understand um, the, the actions and the decision better. So, um, actually, in IBM uh, um, AI research group, so they come up to this uh, so-called 
XAI question bank. So basically, they interviewed 20 uh, UX and the interaction designer very intensively. So and then come up to this <clears throat> and this uh, UX designer, they work on the different AI products. So and then they come up to this so-called question bank. So it depends on the or the question that user ask. So then we'll formulate different uh, feedback to or answer to them uh, to the human. So and when human are, uh, want explanation, so there are different motivations uh, underlying it. So they may want to gain further insight uh, about <clears throat> or evidence for the AI system decisions, or they want to see rather the AI really works. So and also uh, try to adapt the uh, interactions and, and maybe also reflect on, on the ethical responsibility. There are many different motivation underlying explanations. So and then the implication of the X, XAI design is um, explanation that need to be selective. You don't want to overwhelm the user with too much information so, or too details. So at the same time, you want to engage the users with social in nature. So at the end, the explanation delivery should be interactive and also maybe conversational. This, so as I say, the, the engagement. So, but then, uh, of course, the trade-off between the XAI and the UX. If you inter or uh, if you give too much information, somehow you also disrupt the the workflow or disrupt the experience. So this is really have to strike the right balance. And talking about the conversational, so this is I shift to my third um third um uh, topic is about um uh, con uh, the chatbot. So I, I really like this uh, quote, conversation is the interface. So as technology gets smarter and more anticipatory of our wants and intent, again, the intent is here, the interface gets smaller and smaller until it disappears. So now um, this, uh, I'll give you a very, very brief history of the chatbot. So it started in 1966 uh, with Eliza. So at that time, it's very primitive, just key keyword matching and the min with the minimal context identification. So somehow the response does not make sense. So and then moves fast forward to uh, late 90, 1990s, sorry, late 90s and early uh, 2000. So Alice uh, was born, so it demonstrates some conversational capability and also lead to the development of the um, uh, AI markup language for developing chatbot. So more recently, we have the machine learning powers, uh, um, IBM Watson or um, Google uh, Mina. So this is they based on the deep new, new network. So this is the more recent development of chatbots. So, and also Chapel is getting more and more integrated and embedded in the IoT environment. So this is more recent development. Many of you are already familiar with uh, Google Home with Alexa, so and so. And the, this is the Forrester research. So now we are in the 2018, 2021 in the middle column. So rather you agree that we are already in this stage or we are still waiting to reach to this stage. But in two years time or one year times, we we may be able to create content together with our chatbots, but, but rather it can be realized. We can wait and see. So and the chatbot and conversational agents somehow is can be it seems a, a, a quite a confusion out there about the terminology. So and but I, I try to uh, group it this way. So, but maybe there are different ways to, to group or classify them. So, but uh, one of them is the IVR, the interactive voice response. So probably all of you have experienced to dial up a, a service and press a, a key number and wait ages for ages to, uh, until a human talk to you. So not all of you have a very good use experience with this kind of uh, IVR. So, but anyway, so for the conversational agents, we have two major types, the embody and non-embody. So, and then under each type, you can have a task-oriented or non-task-oriented type. So, but for the chatbots, I will put it under the non-embody one. But again, so other researchers may not agree on that kind of classifications. So, and but somehow we use it quite interchangeably. So there are also different types or different uh, uh, um, uh, chatbot. So conversation agents be, uh, depends on their um, uh, characteristic. So text and voice already two big major types. So open domain or closed domain. So like uh, open domain is uh, Google Mina. So closed domain, you can only talk to the Google, uh, sorry, talk to the chatbot on a specific uh, topic. 
So task oriented, not task oriented dimensions, so also the dialogue management approach, you have uh, from rule based retrieval and the generative phase. So this is a, a way to classify the chatbot and conversation agent. Of course, uh, talking about chatbot, so we have to uh, mention about the NLP is really the, the, the foundations. So the NLP is really, uh, I think many of you already know, so it is a uh, turning the unstructured data into a structured data format for understanding and to formulate response. But NLU is um, more reasons uh, because it's uh, driven by machine learning. So, so it's to enable to understand so kind of uh, unexpected or non-synthetical um, utterance. So like you make errors or you have accent or you have a sentiment. So the NLU can comprehend or make, make sense of what the user want to say, the, again, the intent. So and then NLG is the uh, production or, or construction of the, of the uh, response. So and, and now talk about the embody uh, chatbot. So I give an example here. So. And this is how to um, um, evaluate the so user engagement or disengagement with an embodied uh, conversational agent. So this is a work in, in Kai 2019. So uh, the researcher, so they built four different uh, version of a chatbot. So one is voice only, so called ADA, I, I, I don't show it here. So another one is called C, so it's really like Alexa, but uh, you, 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 it creates a holographic image, you have to wear the HoloLens to see that image, and you can talk to uh, this Z. So another version is to create really a human size uh, uh, avatar sitting, sitting opposite to you and chat with you. So um, it's quite creepy. And, and then the, the fourth option is uh, like a mini human, it's called uh, Mickey, so it's standing on the table and talk to you as an augmented reality uh, trick. So, and they do a evaluations to see how users engage with the four options of the chatbot. So, and they measure, so the, the verbals respond, also the gaze, the, the, the gesture, and also the self-report measure. So these are four dimensions, they measure, also including trust, trust. And then also some implicit feedback. So how long they gaze at the object, uh, at the avatar, and the, the long, how long the utterance and the number of utterance. So you can guess which which of the four <laughs> was the most uh, engaging and, and most uh, preferable. Actually, it's the Mickey, so the small mini AR. So so the uh, participant found this is most likable and most uh, trustworthy. So uh, trustworthy. So it's interesting finding. So and of course, uh, all this kind of uh, uh, um, real life algorithmic adaptation is we want to understand so the user needs and also. Uh, uh, if we understand the user preference, we can adapt the conversation, also adapt the, the presentations it's in a different way. At the end, we want the user to have a good user experience. So we'll talk about this uh, embodied um, chatbot, so we can now come to the non-embodied one. So this is a Q&A chatbot. So it uh, is called Chip. It was used in IBM as an internal um, uh, agent. So for the new employee, when, when they want to uh, know more some information about the company, they use this. So and then the IBM uh, uh, researcher, they they uh, try to evaluate. So how how bad or good did the design of this uh, chatbot? So you can see that. So this upper Right, so this is the, um, the case that the chatbot, the chip cannot handle the request. So you can see that the conversation, so this uh, hash hash fail is the indicator that the chatbot cannot, um, uh, um, uh, out of the capacity, they cannot answer the, the questions. So and on the left hand side, this is more so task oriented interactions. You can see the user really asks some factual information. And then for the lower, as a low right here is a more fun seeking, so uh, interaction. So and then they they analyze all these uh, utterance and, and dialogue. So they try to understand. So actually, so how how good or bad this um, uh, chatbot was perceived by them uh, participant. So and they based on the so-called conversational act. 
than the lexical feature. So the conversational act is a type of the conversation that they use. So that when they talk to them, the chatbot. So and the back of words is uh, the machine learning thing. They try to uh, also um, understand about the type of uh, the language they use. So and then you can see the rather they satisfy the functionality or they they satisfy also with the playfulness of of the chatbot. So you can see if they ask formal questions or if they say make a sarcastic remark, it means they they very negative perception of the chatbot. So and also the so-called agent ability check. What can you do? So can you do X Y Z? So this is also a kind of indication that the user is not happy at all with the chatbot, and and also say bye. That means they don't want to talk to the chatbot anymore. So there's also very different, interesting. So um, the feedback they 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 got from the user. But uh, interestingly, you can see that so they collect the emoti uh, emoticon, but they they didn't analyze it. So for me, it's a very uh, uh, um, a surprise because um, voice is a very strong carrier of emotion. So this is also the work I've been um, engaged about the speech emotion recognition. So we all know that voice can carry uh, when I shout, when I when I lower my volume, I can indicate my emotions. So and uh, but the, the, the IBM group not yet work on the emotion, but they are working on it now. So, but the speech emotion recognition have been quite a long, actually 20, about 20 something years history now. So, but um, more recently, uh, because of a uh, stronger, a better algorithm, they, they can now predict the emotions better. So the speech is talk about the linguistic, also about the acoustic. So linguistic related to the content and the acoustic related to sounds that we can use the AI, uh, AI technique, machine learning technique to derive the emotion. But bear in mind that, so the accuracy is still quite low for the emotions, yeah. So, and of course, it's also very important about the emotion representation, the modeling, and also, as I mentioned before, the annotation. So this is where the humans really quite uh, play a very important role to annotate them. Um, the emotions at the end, the machines learn from, from the annotations and build uh, the prediction uh, classifier. So this is very complicated, there's a different component involved. So and um, uh, also uh, my announcement. So we will uh, organize um, a Dutch seminar in September. So uh, then we'll bring in uh, all, um, not all, um, uh, the active uh, researchers together to discuss about the trustworthy conversational agents. So yeah, it'll be very exciting. So hope that it will really take place. So face to face, I mean. And also with another activity is a conversation 2021. So we are, it's a continuation of, uh, um, of our workshops is a checkbot research and design. So at the end, so I think that the, the final thought is that the core nature of human actually do not change technology to change very rapidly. So a human technology is really now become symbiotic. So in the human computer is the integration is more than interactions I mentioned. At the end of the days, we absolutely need the foundation of computer science and mathematics for us to do the human autonomous system design or research. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Effie. Uh, very interesting talk, lots of uh, things to discuss. Let me see if there are any questions already. Uh, so we have an applause by one of the participants, Matthias. Hi, uh, sorry, yes, yes, just, please go ahead. I can't just ask a question without writing. Sorry. No, sure, sure, please go ahead, uh, Lorenzo. Yes, thank you. Uh, so how, um, how did you go about verifying the data sets that you would use to, uh, uh, to train the AI for uh, Chat, uh, chat box. How 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 was the verification process? That did you, did you or have you tried and implemented in terms of verifying the data sets that this data set is enough to make a trustworthy chat chat box? What's the methodology for that? If there is any, or is it part of it or not? Thank you very much. So um. Okay, maybe. If I understand your question correctly, so you ask how we validate the data set. How you verify 
the data set. Now, the data set is uh, enough for, a tr for to, to call a particular machine learning is a trustworthy machine learning. You know, you know, you know what I mean? So I think, uh, of course, is if it, uh, let's put example about the the human emotion recognition. So if we somehow the the data set and we annotate the data set. So and and we say that uh, somehow let's say it's the visual or the sound or then like the fa facial emotions we call it is a negative or, or or a sad. But end of that. So when we predict in the future unseen uh, data, so we we see that actually there's a mismatch. So we we annotate as a set end of this actually is angry or something else. So this kind of uh, mismatch of we annotate and end up the predictions is wrong. So it's a kind of the, the, the wrong prediction already quite a, a clear indication about is this not that uh, reached the level of trustworthiness. We of course, of course, and I show the diagram. We have to really um, uh, update the model to make it classify in a better way. So I don't know whether I'm answering your, your questions. Is it? I'm, I'm more into the, the verification process that went into the verifying a data set is enough. Let's say I chose 10,000 data points and I say 10,000 data points is enough to, to make this chat box trustworthy or maybe 15,000 data points or we'll, okay, make, yeah, it, yeah. we'll make it as, even the quality of it. How do we verify? That okay. Data yeah. Point? Yeah, I understand this point now. So uh, about the number of data set is really, I think I cannot put a pin down a number. So as usual, the principle is as many data as many data uh, points as, as possible to really enrich them or, or improve them, the classifier. So, but I, I think at the end, we, as, as I say, the human in the loops, we really have to go back to the human. So to see rather the predictions uh, really corresponding to the uh, the real perception or the real feeling. So, but then how large the data set should be or could be or, or, or must be, I really cannot print down the number. So, yeah. So if, if I may, I have a follow up question uh, mm. which may relate to Lorenzo's question. So so uh, how are these models typically constructed? So the models you showed about th those task models looked very much like uh, state machines of some sort, right? I mean, that 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 was my very naive uh, interpretation of how they looked like. Is that right or? So it is not really the, the, the state machine. So uh, of course, we also based on the if we observe that the, the let's say a human how they carry a certain task so and then we break it down into a step by step so and and then we try to also together with the, the human we co-create a kind of um, a, a structure the workflow and then formalize it in the like the goal models the goal so the operations the, the method so we really have to break down the the human behaviors into small steps so and then fit into this model so like the hierarchical tree also we do it this way so we do the observation and then break it down and try to formalize it but but uh, the observations are made informally and then there is a human being that turns those observations into, into a model yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there are, there are no attempts to to automate that process of uh, say learning or or constructing a model from observations automatically. So I think that there should be something out there but at the end of the day we still again the human in the loop we, we have to uh, the check um, rather this is really the, the actual representation the accurate representation of the mm -hmm. the human behavior. Yeah. Because on our side of the world it's quite common to have um, an engine an automatic engine that interacts with with, um, uh, with some sort of teacher that, that could correct the uh, correct the observation generated by that. So you you first build an abstraction automatically, and then ask questions: Is this behavior included in what you uh, what you could uh, accept as uh, in reality? And then the teacher will tell you, no, this is not good. So. Uh, this type of interactive learning, active learning, is, is nothing is is not tried in in your domain. So I, I think the of course uh, I think this is quite a similarity here. So we derive some the from the observations into some kind of high level description, and then maybe also break it down into 
uh, uh, a formal language. So uh, then we need humans to really um, uh, cross check. So this kind of uh, representation. But the so. automatic engine could ask the human uh, whether this, uh, for, for, for example, about corner cases, whether this is a corner case that you would accept or this is not uh, something that you would accept as a, as a, as a behavior. Yeah, I think I, I can uh, imagine that it could be automated this way. So, but um, I, I should say that I'm not absolutely uh, sure that uh, it can work perfectly, or uh, can be automated perfectly, yeah. Uh, are there other questions? Uh, yeah, actually, actually, I have a few questions, but I don't want to sort of, I need to give other people chance to ask questions, so I'm going to sure, be quiet sure. for a bit. You still have time, so hopefully we'll get back to you, Lauren, so don't worry. Uh, Matthias has a question. Matthias, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, hi, Epi. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. I was wondering, uh, do you have an idea or is there any research on the relation between um, content and behavior of the ch chatbot? Like how much is it the, the knowledge or the, the content responses that make me trust into the chatbot? And how much is it their behavior, like how they respond um, to my answers if they reveal uncertainty. So, so is there a, like a ratio between those two things? So I don't, I, I think it's very context dependent. So anyway, well, thank you for the question. So I think that rather a long answer or short answer can satisfy a user need. So it really much depends on the, the question. So maybe mm -hmm. some yes or no will be is, uh, something is, is enough. So I think that I am not aware there's a such um, so correlation study. So about the length of the utterance or the length of the response to the user satisfaction about the, the response. So, but I, 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 I would say it's really context dependent, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions? Uh, uh, if there are no questions, Lorenzo, please feel welcome to ask your question. Yeah, thank you very much. Going back to the, uh, the data sets that uh, created, um, how did you, uh, what's the process that did you put in place in order to derive the requirements um, to synthesize the data sets for the chat box uh, in the context of a human in the loop design approach? So it's more, I'm more into the understanding what's the process. Is there, is there any particular process that you take in like a system engineering process I'm, I'm, I'm referring here, or call a holistic engineering process. Is there any particular process for deriving requirement for training set itself? Thank you very so, much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the for the question. So I think basic technique we always use is to always go back to the user. So through very extensive interview, so like the example I show you about the IBM researcher, so they really do very um, uh, um, a long interview with individual participants to extract, so what are the experience, what are the expectations. So, so this we can, uh, through this interview, we then systematically coding and analyze the data to extract the requirements. Maybe all of them expect that. So the response from the chatbot should be short and sweet. So or should be also fun and 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 engaging. So uh, this is the the basic prin principle is really go back to the user. So we can also combine the observation with interview. So how they normally interact with with the chatbot with the existing chatbot. So then we can also derive what kind of errors, what kind of um of uh, um so-called satisfaction they have. So then we can enrich the satisfaction fe features and also maybe address the errors they make. So at the end, this combination of observation and, and interview and also the questionnaire. So this is the, the so-called our golden rule or the golden uh, technique we can apply to uh, to get the user data. So and, and from the user data, how to convert into a requirement is another another steps. But then the basic thing was we have to go back to the user. Yeah. I hope I answered your question. Okay, are there any further questions? So, uh, if in general, what I sense is that there is uh, may maybe a lack, or may maybe there is there is uh, some opportunity for for further interaction. For example, when Lorenzo was asking about process. So there is a big community in software engineering which talks about process. I'm not an expert there, but uh, both systems and software engineering people have looked into that. 
so do you think there is an opportunity to to look at the process of of uh, those experiments and 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 make that more formal and 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 analyze different sorts of processes in that domain? So um so what exactly? So, for example, when we are doing uh, development of any type of system, the, the way you go about different steps of the development, uh, you, you do requirement elicitation, you do uh, design, you do development. So, so there, there are all sorts of processes um, that are designed for, for various types of needs and, and, and organizations. And, and there are even languages, formal languages that specify how that process is built, right? Yep. Uh, so I... I from from your answer, I gather there might be uh, a room there in, in your field to to specify the process of uh, human in the loop design that that could benefit from from those uh, studies. I, I don't know. I, I have no idea whether this is this has already been done or not. I'm just uh, trying to understand. Yeah, I think of course uh, there are some other more so-called um, uh, formal uh, formalized work out there. Is uh, really so-called uh, represent the human to look in a more formalized way. So, and um, maybe I, what I uh, present is just a more high level so that there may be uh, already some work out there. So I, I, I believe that they, are, they already have this kind of process going on. So, yeah. yeah so, so for example, in, in, venue, in your key venues like Kai, there, there are typically those type of contributions where people look at, uh, for example, workflow models and, and things like that. For sure, yes, yes, okay, yes. No, yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, if there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much for having attended. Uh, so because Effie did not, uh, at the last part in the question part, did not share her slides, some names will appear on the YouTube channel. I, I think it would be a pity if I don't post uh, the, uh, the question and answer part. So if anyone has an objection uh, with his name or her name appearing on, on, on the YouTube posting, please let me know. Um, the second point, very important point, is that in two weeks we will uh, host Kerstin Eder. I think she's already here in, in the chat, uh, in, in, in the meeting. Thanks for having joined. She will be talking about intelligent testing. And uh, the uh, announcement for that talk will, will go out tomorrow morning. Uh, with the link to join. So uh, please uh, do not miss that opportunity to, to listen to this uh, forthcoming very exciting talk. Um, if there are no further questions. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> if there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much and uh, see you in two weeks time. Thank you. <laughs>